Hello, Geography 41, and welcome to my very first recording of an online lecture. I am pre-recording the lecture for March 27th. For those of you who may not be able to get to class on the 27th or if you want to have access to the lecture notes, uh, I will also be recording our Zoom session, which we will have on the 27th. So you can also access the, um, the review that we do then. Um, the topic that I'm talking about today is actually a thread that I've tried to weave into the course throughout the semester, which is this issue of error and uncertainty in data and how it is so incumbent upon us to understand the sources of error and uncertainty and communicate them effectively in order to be good scientists and to produce good science. I have provided you with some links, and I think I mentioned this book to you before when it first came out this, uh, this year, it came out earlier this year. And Naomi Oreskes is a professor, she used to be at UCSD, and she's written a book called Why Trust Science, and it relates to what we're experiencing in society right now, is that if there are questions about science, people don't want to trust it. And I will leave it at that, except encourage you to watch her YouTube video, her TED Talk. And the key that ties into the topic that I'm talking about today is that it's important to recognize the limitations of the data that we work with, the limitations of the work and report it as best as possible um, so that we can be responsible geospatial practitioners. And the issue is, or the problem is, that in geospatial science, there are no buttons that allow us to do this. We, we don't have an error button on the ArcGIS interface that provides us with the mechanisms to do this. So I'm going to talk about some of the, the underlying concepts of error and uncertainty. And then I'm going to jump into your homework assignment, which is a lab, where we can come up with ways of grappling with this within um, the data. I also have provided in the lab folder that you'll see, I've provided you with some reading resources and two of these articles by, are by uh, faculty in the geography department, Dr. Lena Lee, my colleague Hewan Bon, Dr. Bon and myself. We've both written on this subject and I encourage you to take a look at those articles. But Dr. Michael Goodchild has written a very accessible and um, interesting piece on how scale and GIS is relevant to uh, understanding the limitations and uh, of the work that we do. So I encourage you to read those articles. Okay, without further ado, I think we need to start out with some basic definitions. So what am I talking about? We have two terms, error and uncertainty. Error is defined as the departure of a measurement from its true value. And uncertainty is defined as our lack of knowledge about that error. You were brought up in grade school thinking that when you got something wrong, it was a bad mark on your paper, you got a red mark, you had an error, and an error is bad, error is bad, error is bad. But what I want to do with these notes is to change your frame of reference, and at least in the context of spatial data, I want you to start thinking about as error that is something that is a fact and an inherent component of all data, all spatial data. And the best that we can do is understand as much as possible about that error so that we can quantify what we don't know about it, our lack of knowledge about it or our uncertainty. This quote that I have in this slide is from a while ago, but it's the point that I'm trying to make to you. In science, the word error does not carry the usual connotations of the term mistake or blunder. Error in a scientific measurement means the inevitable uncertainty that attends all measurements. Errors are not mistakes. You cannot eliminate them by being very careful. The best you can do is ensure that errors are as small as reasonably possible and to have a reliable estimate of how large they are. So how does this translate into geospatial data? Well, errors can arise at any stage of the mapping process and they can impact the results of our analyses. And as Burrow and McDonnell, who actually these, uh, Two authors wrote the very first textbook that most of us used when we taught GIS. Um, 
Right. It is very important to understand the nature of errors in spatial data and the effect they may have on the quality of the analyses that we do, the analyses that are made with GIS. Before we move on into discussions of, of um, the sources of error, the factors that affect the, relia the reliability of spatial data, there's two other terms that bear um, definitions. You've used and probably seen these terms in previous courses, and they are precision and accuracy. Often we conflate these two terms, and so I wanted to have a slide here where I just re revisited or revisit the definitions of these terms. So precision is a term that is usually, um, that, that refers to how close our level of measurement is, like what are our significant digits? How far out can we measure? How precise are, is, are our measurements? We use precision, we use the standard deviation statistic to represent precision. So when, how close we are, when you think of a normal distribution, how tight is that normal curve? That's, that's the term precision. And precision is not a spatial statistic. It's a data set, it's a population statistic. So for example, in the standard deviation of a test grades of, the, of a population of a class, you have a mean and a standard deviation and it relates to that population or that sample of the data. It's not tied to a place on earth. Accuracy is our, arguably, our geospatial statistic for qualifying or quantifying error in our data and how good our data are. In order to calculate accuracy, which we do using the root mean square error statistic, we need to have a, a data set of higher accuracy. So it requires some additional data gathering. Accuracy refers to how far off you are from some location or some accepted truth. So say, for example, you have an elevation value and you have the elevation value in your data set and then you compare it to the actual value that is measured with a high accuracy GPS and you see how far off you are on average. And that's the root mean square error. You may have seen these statistics before in other classes. Uh, we may have time to delve a little bit more into these, but I just wanted to provide those definitions for you. You've probably seen these two uh, ways of representing the differentiation between accuracy and precision, which is the good old dartboard, which I know we can't go to bars anymore, but if you could imagine yourself at a bar and throwing your darts, you may hit all, I think this is the 18, I can't remember. You may be very precise. Your darts may be very, very close. You're precise in where you're hitting, but you're far off from the bullseye, which is your accuracy. Here in this depiction, you're very accurate. You've hit the bullseye, but your points are not very precise. These are the statistics, standard deviation versus the root mean square error. They are very similar, except um, where standard deviation, which you probably are very familiar with, compares every single value to the mean of the population and subtracts it, squares it so you have no negative values, takes on average the, the difference for the whole population, um, sums all those up, takes the average, and then unsquares it. RMSE does the same thing, but it compares each location to its localized truth. That's the root mean square error. And so root mean square error is our accuracy statistic that we use to qualify the accuracy of spatial data, or quantify the accuracy of spatial data. Okay, so moving on, what are some of the factors that affect the spatial data reliability, reliability of spatial data? So we've probably already dealt with some of these in the class, and I just wanted to give a few bullet points. So age of data, census data. We're dealing with census data that's from 2010. It's 2020. The census is in, in jeopardy right now. Fill out your census forms. I'm going to put something on Beachboard so you can reply to the census. Age of data, very important. You may have data sets that are, our maps are static in time and you have to be responsible about reporting what the date was. Say you're doing a fire analysis and you haven't included the most recent fire season. That's an age of data issue. Aerial extent. You may not have data that covers the same aerial extent, so you have may need have a data set that's at a different scale for the for the matching, say Long Long Beach versus Huntington Beach. You may have two different data sets from two different sources and different scales that you may have to address. Map scale we're going to talk about. 
Um, density of observa observations I'll talk about in the next slide. Relevance. Um, oftentimes we use data as an excuse for another data set. So for example, we do an analysis um, for say gnat catcher habitat and we think that gnat catcher habitat, the gnat catcher likes a certain elevation, a certain vegetation, and a certain um, uh, distance from uh, people. So we put that together, we come up with areas that we think are gnat catcher habitat, and we say that's the gnat catcher habitat. You have to be careful about the relevance and, and being responsible about communicating the criteria that you've used to perform an analysis. Numerical errors in the computer are something that happens. We just don't know when they're happening or have control over, but I thought I'd throw that in the slides. So next, let's get back to this idea of sampling. So some of you may be familiar with issues of sampling, and that gets to this concept or, uh, of aliasing in your data. Aliasing is when you don't sample a data set at its natural frequency. So in geospatial data, it may be that we have a data set that doesn't match the scale of the process that we're trying to understand. And there's actually, um, a term uh, uh, in digital image processing and in, in engineering called the Nyquist frequency, which actually describes this inability, to, uh, the, the frequency of the natural cycle. You have to monitor it at its natural frequency or at least twice its natural frequency in order to get at it, in order to represent it. And we often don't have data either at that scale or even know what the natural cycle is of that phenomenon that we're trying to monitor. And in not matching the scale of the sampling with the scale of the data, with the scale of the process, it results in a bias. Some of these things we just don't have control over, but we do our best to qualify them and quantify them. Here's another example. In field, some of you are probably more familiar with this in field sampling. So you go out and say you want to sample water quality. Uh, say uh, you're, you're sampling temperature in a stream and upstream the factory is dumping its effluent at 2 a.m. but you're only going out at 7 a.m. to sample so you're not getting at that variability in the signal because you're not sampling at a frequency um, that is able to match that at that that sampling frequency so you're missing the pattern and that's just something that we have to do our best to get data that we think will match the process that we're trying to understand using the geospatial analyses that we perform. And it's just something that we have to be aware of is, is sampling is, is a large issue. There's other sources of error in spatial data. How accurate are the attributes that are in our data set? And another example of aliasing and biasing is when people go out and collect data, there's natural differences between observers. What I might think is a, a certain type of soil, somebody else may call it a different type of soil. Um, there's, diff there's just differences. That, that's why quality assurance, quality control is a very large, very large aspect of data quality procedures with geospatial data. There's also lab errors, um, natural spatial variation, and here's the next concept that I'm going to spend some time talking about. And this is the issue that we'll be dealing with in our uh, lab exercise, which is related to map scale and positional accuracy. What do I mean by positional accuracy? Well, in 1947, the government released what are called map accuracy standards. So for any paper map, the government, we acknowledge that there are generalizations that are inherent in maps and they had to come up with some standards for what is allowable error within a map. And the National Map Accuracy Standards actually state that for maps that are at a scale of 1 to 20,000 or larger, so large scale, small area, so 1 to 20,000, 1 to 10,000, something that's really zoomed in, no more than 10% of the points tested can have an error of 1 30th of an inch. Okay, let's Next slide, we'll talk about what that actually means. Maps smaller or more zoomed out, so 1 to 24,000, 1 to 100,000, 1 to 250,000, no more than 10% of those sample points can be off by 1 50th of an inch. So how, do, how does that, what does that mean? 
I've given you a spreadsheet with these numbers, but what this comes out to is if you do the dimensional analysis of the map scale, the one to 12,000, one inches to 12,000 inches, and convert those inches into feet, is that a map of one to 12,000, one to 20,000, you can have your points, lines, or polygons, or any feature represented on that map off by up to 33 feet, 55 feet. And in our quadrangle maps, which are one to 24,000, Positional accuracy can be up, can be off by up to 40 feet. So when you're looking at data in a GIS, it's really hard to discern what 40 feet are. But let's see what that actually looks like. I know it's an artist's rendering, but here's the poss you have your point, and if you look at a normal distribution, you have the possibility of that point being where it is, and it's got a high probability of being there. But there's a possibility, nonetheless, that that point is really over here, over here, over here. The probability is lower, but there's still the possibility, nonetheless. So you have this fuzziness inherent in every position. Every point, line, or polygon has fuzziness associated with it, and we do not do a good job at all in ArcGIS and GIS of representing what that fuzziness is. We like to th see features on a map as discrete, discrete points, lines, and polygons. You can tell I'm very passionate about this. Here's what this might look like for a line rendering. So your line has the possibility of being where it is, your stream, your road, whatever it is, but it has the, um, but it also has a possibility at one to 24,000 of being off by 40 feet. Now there's probably a low probability, so you have a probability distribution going on here, but it still could be off. It's fuzzy around that location where it actually is on the map. That's the issue with positional accuracy. And that's something that GIS, as I said, does not do a good job of representing. This information is not just something that I'm passionate about. It's expected as something that geospatial practitioners understand. And to that end, for those of you who don't know that there's this, there's this um, test that you can take to be certified as a GIS practitioner or a GISP. And after you have a certain number of years of experience doing geospatial work, you can apply to sit for the test. And this was actually one of the questions on the practice test. According to national map accuracy standards, what percentage of features must be within 1 30th of an inch or less from their intended horizontal accuracy at a scale of 1 to 20,000 or larger? Well, it's just asking the opposite of how I stated it in the previous slide. So it's important to understand positional accuracy. In the lab exercise that we're going to explore, uh, we're going to come up with ways of representing the fuzziness around these discrete points, lines, and polygons. I encourage you to take a look at Joseph Kursky's article. I know um, he's the education manager at Esri, and here are a few quotes from or a couple of quotes from that article. It all comes down to paying close attention to your data and knowing its sources, which, which, for example, the map accuracy standards, what is the allowable error that's in a particular data set, uh, and that's related to maps and scale. And with great opportunity comes great responsibility. We have a vast array of data at our fingertips with powerful and easy to use tools and models. We press intersect, we geoprocess, we clip, we we intersect, we buffer, and we represent features with these discrete boundaries, but there's really fuzziness around them. And how does that propagate each time we push one of those buttons? Well, GIS doesn't do a good job of helping us understand that there are implications of these map accuracy standards and allowable error in a map um, and how those might manifest in the results of our analyses. So the key is for you to be sure to be critical of your data be truthful about your data and be a good scientist and be a good practitioner and um, user of spatial data. Be a responsible geospatial practitioner. So with that, I am going to pause uh, the lecture and we are going to walk through in the next set, in the next video, the lab exercise.